One of the more interesting organisms to study is the starfish. Now imagine an animal that has its endoskeleton just under the skin, that lacks any noticeable sensory organs such as eyes, and has no brain. This animal has no clearly defined excretory system, no circulatory system, and it has a water vascular system that aids in movement and feeding. That's what we see with the phylum Eachinodermata. The eachinoderms are unsegmented, exclusively marine animals characterized by an internal skeleton composed of a calcium plate, and it frequently is going to bear spines. The phylum name literally means spiny skin. So when we look at the eachinoderms, what we're going to see is the presence of, of a water vascular system, and we're going to see locomotion occurring due to hydrostatic pressure within the system, uh, and it's going to use structures called tube feet for this to occur. Now again there are approximately 7,000 living species of eachinoderms and they are completely marine living in salt water. Generally these organisms are going to be found in the benthic region which is going to be the bottom of the sea. The starfish was once classified in the class steroidea but has since been reclassified as the class astrodea. Now we will be looking at the external anatomy of the starfish and we're going to be looking at the aboral surface which is the side away from the mouth. The body is composed of a central disc that we'll see located right here. Uh, around this we're going to see the five radiating arms. Usually the rays are going to be of equal size and length but some may be shorter, indicating that the arm may have been damaged or lost and the animal has regenerated one of these. So that the starfish can readily regenerate any arm that is lost. Some starfish can employ autotomy, which is uh, the ability to break off a part of the body when in danger. And this is just a means for it to escape. Now at the end of each of the rays is an eye spot. The eye spot is also called the ocelli, and it contains light-sensitive cells. The eye spot can detect light and dark, but not visual images. So the eye spots are not visible on a preserved specimen, but if you were looking at a live specimen, the eye spots would look like a reddish dot just above the sensory tentacles on each arm, right in these areas, right along in here. Right here we have the major porite, and this major porite is the opening of the water vascular system. Notice that it's located near the edge of that central disc, and then near the opposite end we would have a very small anal opening. Uh, this is going to be very difficult for you to see. Uh, the dermal endoskeleton of the starfish is from the mesoderm germ layer, and it consists of, of numerous plates and it's composed of 95% calcium carbonate. Now if we take this spine area and we look at this under magnification, we'll see a circle of tiny pincher-like structures uh, that we'll observe at the base of each of the spine. And each of these structures are called pediciaries. And the jaws of these pediciaries can open and shut, and they believe the function is to keep the surface clean of foreign material. Now this is the oral side of the, the uh, starfish, the mouth side, and notice that you'll see this circular mouth, and it's surrounded by oral spines and a soft membrane, uh, the perostrum. These grooves that extend outward uh, from the mouth to the tips of each of the rays is called the ambercal grooves and they have flexible spines that line the sides of the grooves and they can move back and forth over the grooves for protection. Located in these grooves are finger-like uh, locomotion structures known as tube feet. And gas exchange and excretion will also occur through these tubed feet. So here we have the tubed feet. The rows of tube feet run along the ambulacral ridge in each of the arms and they function in respiration, feeding, locomotion, and sensing the surrounding environment. Now each of these two feet has a sucker to grasp the prey. It has a body called the podium 
and attached on the interior end of the podium is a balloon-like structure called the ampulla. The ampulla works as an interior uh, water pressure ballistic that contracts and extends the tube feet. So the tube feet are part of that water vascular system. So here we can see a close-up of the mouth. We can see those spines that are covering the mouth. In this area would also be the uh, peristrome. Running out from the mouth, out through each of the rays, we see the ambricle um, grooves. We can see the spines that are located on either side of the grooves. And then right within those grooves, we're seeing the tubed feet. Starfish are carnivores. They feed on a variety of marine animals, including mollusks, other eachinoderms, small fish that we can see in this diagram here, uh, polychaete worms, and small crustaceans. Now, they will use the suckers on the tip of those two feet to uh, create a secure grasp on their, their prey. Now, mollusks such as clams are a favorite food of many starfish. And the feeding strategy is uh, used by feeding on the clam is really incredible. The starfish will approach the clam and using its arms it will position itself with the valves of the shell facing up directly under the mouth. And by using hydrost uh, that hydrostatic pressure within the water vascular system and the ampulla contracting, this causes the two feet to extend towards the clam. The suckers on the tips of the two feet will create a secure grasp and the starfish will reposition the clam and lift it closer to the mouth. Using its muscular arms and two feet, the starfish will pry open the shell of the clam and by contracting the body wall, uh, the cardiac stomach will be inverted out of the mouth and onto the soft body of the clam. Gastric juices and digestive enzymes, which are produced by the pyloric cecum section of the pyloric stomach, are released during, um, during this process directly onto the clam's body, and then digestion begins within the shell. Once the clam's body is partially digested and softened, then the starfish begins to feed. And once the starfish has finished feeding, the body wall will relax and the cardiac stomach will retreat back into the body cavity. So here we have that cardiac stomach located right in this area here and then just underneath the pyloric stomach. So that uh, initially the, uh, the internal digestive system consists of the mouth connected to the cardiac stomach through a short esophagus and then attached to the cardiac stomach on the aboral side of the central disc is the pyloric stomach. The pyloric stomach and that pyloric cecum area is the area that's responsible for the majority of the digestion. Now, uh, on the aboral side of the pyloric stomach, we'll also see the intestinal structures and the anus. Now, here we have removed the top portion of um, one of the, uh, the rays, and we've exposed the hepatic cecum. Now, this hepatic cecum, also known as the pyloric cecum, it's the most prominent feature of each of the arms. These are those digestive glands that secrete the enzymes and absorb the nutrients for digestion. So this organ is responsible for the majority of digestion. Now, right in this area are the gonads. The echinoderms are dioecious, which means that the male and the female reproductive structures are on separate individuals. So despite uh, separate sexes, there's no overt uh, sexual dimorphism. You will not be able to tell if your specimen is a male or female. Now these are, are uh, paired gonads, and depending on the gender of the starfish, you'll have either testes or ovaries, and you will not be able to determine. Um, the gonads can vary in size. Uh, and according to the time of the year that your starfish was harvested will determine the size of the gonads. If these are very large and prominent, then your starfish was harvested during the mating season. If these are greatly reduced and almost absent, then your starfish was harvested during the time of the year when it is not mating. As we review over the water vascular system of the eachinoderm, the water vascular system is unique to the eachinoderms. It functions in respiration, sensory perception, locomotion, and feeding. It may also serve some um, excretory functions, and it consists of a series of water-filled channels that are pressurized. Water will enter through the major porite, and the major porite is then attached 
um, to a stone canal. Now this major porite is on the aboral surface. Uh, it functions as a hydraulic regulator of pressure for the rest of the water vascular system. The fluid that moves through the system is composed of seawater, soluble proteins, and potassium ions. Now from the major porite, the fluid will then move to the short stone canal and then into the uh, circular ring canals and these are located at the central disc of the starfish body. Attached to the ring canals we would then move out to the radial canals and each of the five arms has a radial canal. Each radial canal runs along and then we will have uh, the lateral canals that are connected to the radial canal. The lateral canals are attached at the other end to the ampulla and that's the top portion of the tube feet and so water would enter through the major porite, go through the stone canal, through the ring canals, out through the radial canal, the lateral canal, the ampulla, and then leave the starfish through the tubed feet. The various animals that belong to the phylum Eachinodermata may be some of the strangest in the animal kingdom. And it's these unusual aspects of these animals, along with discoveries in genetics, that have caused some of the taxonomic categories to have changed. Currently, it is highly debated as to whether or not there should be five or six classes within this phylum. We will be recognizing five of these classes. Now, we'll begin with the uh, starfish. Now, the starfish was once classified in the class Steroidea. However, recently it has been readjusted and it is no longer in the class Steroidea. It is in the new class Astrodea. And this used to be the order that starfish were placed in. However, it has been upgraded to a class standing. The key factor that places starfish in this new um, class Astrodea is going to be the thick arm that is visible on the rays uh, on the starfish moving out from that central disc. Just as in the uh, starfish, the brittle star has been reclassified. It used to be in the class Steroidea with the starfish and then placed in a new order, Orphoidea. However, the class Steroidea has been dropped and uh, the new class for the brittle star is the Orphoidea, which used to be the, the order. And unlike the plump arms seen on the uh, sea star, the starfish, what we see with the brittle star is very long, thin arms that are demarcations from that central disc. And it's for that reason that the brittle star is placed in its own class away from the starfish, the uh, class Orphoidea. Sea urchins and sand dollars are placed in the class Eachinidea. And this class uh, lacks the, um, the arms. They are typically shaped either as flat or hemispherical. And they, uh, while they lack the arms, they do still have five rows of tube feet that allow them uh, to move about. The sea cucumber and the sea apple on the next slide are both placed in the class Holothoroidea. And this is due to the toxin holothorin that these organisms released. In an aquarium setting, this toxin is strong enough to take out the entire uh, living specimens within the aquarium. So this is very distasteful and uh, avoided by smaller species. However, extremely large uh, organisms such as the puffer fish can be resistant to their toxins. The sea lilies and the sea feathers are placed in the class Crinoidea. Now this class typically has a stalk structure that attaches to the substrate in the adult form. However, the organisms may be free-moving and free-floating uh, within their juvenile state. 